The purpose of today's hearing is to provide you, the community TriMet serves, with an opportunity to comment on the proposed fare and service changes. This is the fifth of five public hearings TriMet is holding on the issue. These hearings will be part of the public record and they are being recorded. If you wish to speak here today, please sign in at the table at the entrance. If you do not sign in, you will not have the opportunity to speak today. If you wish to provide written comments, you may fill out a comment card and leave it at the table at the entrance. You may also deliver your comments by regular mail, email, fax, or by phone. Contact information is available at the sign-in table. To be included in this feedback session phase, please submit your comments by no later than April 6th. I will call you in the order that you signed in today. You will have three minutes to speak, and I will keep track of your time. Please be respectful of others in the room and limit your comments to three minutes. Because this is a public hearing designed to collect your comments, we will not have the opportunity for feedback from the table. I will end this hearing promptly at 7.30. This is an important issue, and I see that we have a lot of people here today, all with important information to share. It is possible that we may not have enough time to accommodate everyone who wishes to speak. And if that happens, I invite you to write your comments on a comment card, or speak directly to a TriMet staff person at the sign-in table, or send an email or fax to TriMet after today's hearing. This phase of the feedback period ends on April 6th. At that time, TriMet staff will review and analyze all the information received from these hearings. Based on that information, the current proposal may be further revised and submitted to the TriMet Board of Directors for their consideration. TriMet Board meetings will be held on April 25th and May 23rd. The public comment period extends to these board meetings. Any approved fare or service changes will take effect in September 2012. I'd like to introduce you also to Mr. T. Allen Bethel, welcome, uh, a member of the TriMet Board. En español, buenas tardes a todos. En estos momentos quisiera darle apertura a la audiencia pública, a favor de tomar asiento y de, sil y de silenciar sus teléfonos. Hola, gracias por asistir. Mi nombre es Dina Marshall de Marshall Mediation. Soy una persona independiente y neutral contratada por TriMet como oficial de audiencias. Aquí presente tenemos a Neil McFarland, gerente y general de TriMet, y también el Dr. T. Allen Bethel, de TriMet Board. El propósito de esta audiencia es darles a ustedes la comunidad a quien le proporciona el servicio TriMet la oportunidad de comentar sobre la propuesta de cambios a los servicios y las tarifas. Esta es la quinta audiencia de cinco, cinco programadas sobre este asunto. Estas audiencias forman parte del registro público y están siendo grabadas. Si desea dar testimonio hoy, favor de apuntarse en la lista que tienen en la mesa al, al entrar. Si, si no se apunta en la lista, no tendrá oportunidad de dar testimonio hoy. Si desea entregar comentarios por escrito, favor de llenar una de las tarjetas para comentario y entregarla en la mesa donde se apuntaron a entrar. También puede enviar sus comentarios por correo regular, por correo electrónico, fax o por teléfono. La información a donde necesita enviar su correspondencia la encuentra en la mesa donde se apuntó al, al entrar. Para que su información se pueda incluir en la fase de comentarios, deben llegar a TriMet para el 6 de abril. Yo llamaré a las personas a testificar en el orden en que se apuntaron hoy día. Tendrán tres minutos para dar su testimonio. Yo vigilaré el tiempo. Por respeto a las otras personas en el salón, favor de limitar su testimonio a tres minutos. Ya que está en la audiencia para recibir su testimonio, no habrá una, una oportunidad para responder a los comentarios por parte de las personas en esta mesa. Daremos por terminada esta audiencia a las siete y media en el punto. 
Este es un asunto muy importante y tenemos bastantes personas hoy, todas con información importante para compartir. Es posible que no haya suficiente tiempo para que todas las personas que quieran hablar hoy no, no lo puedan hacer. Si ese ocurre, ocurre, les invito a que escriban sus comentarios en una tarjeta para comentarios o que hablen directamente con el personal de TriMet en la mesa donde se apuntaron o que envíen sus comentarios por correo electrónico o fax o correo o regular a TriMet después de esta audiencia. Esta fase para comentarios finaliza el 6 de abril. A partir de ahí, el personal de TriMet re revisará y analizará toda la información que se recibió en estas audiencias. En base a esta información, la propuesta actual se modificará y será entregada para que la mesa directiva de TriMet la considere. Las reuniones de la mesa directiva de TriMet se llevarán a cabo, del, a cabo el 25 de abril y el 23 de mayo. El periodo para comentarios se, alar se alarga hasta las fechas de las reuniones de la mesa directiva. Cualquier cambio a las tarifas de servicio en, entra en vigor en septiembre de 2012. Ahora, les quisiera presentar el gerente general de TriMet, el señor Neil McFarland, quien compartirá con ustedes un poco de los antecedentes sobre los cambios propuestos a las tarifas del servicio, la propuesta refinada y los próximos pasos en el proceso de revisión. Hay copias de la propuesta refinada en la mesa donde se apuntaron al, al entrar. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mr. McFarlane, who will provide some backgrounds to the proposed fare and service changes, the refined proposal, and the next steps in the review process. Copies of the refined proposal are available for you at the sign in. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. I know uh, Martin Gonzalez will be providing uh, translation services for my remarks as well as others tonight. I want to, first of all, thank each and every one of you for being here this evening. I know that there are many things that you could be doing and we get full time here with us and we definitely appreciate it. I'd also like to thank uh, board member Dr. T. Allen Bethel for being here uh, and gracing uh, with his presence and his time this evening. Uh, there's also several TriMet staff members here who are available to answer questions um, and they're here uh, for the same reason that those of us up here are, which is solely to hear your comments. Uh, as you may know, TriMet is facing a budget shortfall, uh, $12 million in the current fiscal year. Um, uh, additional issues uh, that may face us in the next related to union arbitration questions. Um, this is basically because of lower than expected employer payroll taxes, anticipated cuts in federal funding, and unsustainable union health care costs. During the last four months, we shared a variety of cost savings and revenue generating options and asked for the public input. More than 3,000 people have provided more than 8,000 comments. Uh, and if you were one of them, we thank you very much for that. And we did listen, and I wanted to make sure everybody paid attention to the refined proposal that, again, as Ms. Marshall noted, is available on the back in the signing table. Uh, and we also uh, refined our recommendations based on input from our board and our budget task force. Um, you'll see that we scaled back the service cuts that were originally discussed quite dramatically. Uh, most of the savings in the budget balance will come from a proposed fare increase and the elimination of free rail zone. Many writers told us they could tolerate a fair increase and have prevented more, more service cuts. We're also proposing a flat fare that eliminates confusing zones. Now, we're certainly not happy about raising fares, but changing to a flat fare will generate half the revenue needed to cover a shortfall while simplifying the system. Uh, you might note our initial proposal called for 500,000 in administrative cuts. You'll now see that we are increasing this commitment to 1.2 million. 
because we heard from you are uh, working to preserve service. These cuts will result in more layoffs and program cuts. Uh, as you imagine, getting the right math while balancing the diversity of you or writers is a huge challenge. But I assure you that Tom is absolutely committed to this as much as possible with the options and the funding available to us. So your participation in this difficult process is appreciated and necessary. And again, thank you for your time here tonight. Ms. Sarah Angel to provide testimony. You'll have three minutes. After Ms. Angel, we'd like to invite Ms. Mara Gross. And is my colleague who is the director of the Small Island Business Association. On behalf of the Swan Island Business Community and over 350 daily writers on the 85 Swan Island bus, we want to thank you and the climate planning staff for reconsidering service cuts to the Climate 85 Swan Island bus. We're bullish about the prospects for Swan Island in the coming years, and our excellent transit is essential for those prospects. Hard times notwithstanding, climate operates one of the best transit systems in the country. And for employees on Swan Island, the 85 Swan Island bus provides the key link to our four max lines and seven bus lines at the Rose Porter Transit Center. Presently, a Western Star Trek plan employee can get to Swan Island from Packman Town Center in under an hour by combining the bus with the uh, Max Green Line and 85 Swan Island bus. As Swan Island employers continue to add new employees, the Swan Island TMA continues its aggressive outreach efforts, including transportation options information and personalized trip plans to those re employees recently hired. In 2011, the TMA's Going to the Island campaign provided over 300 trip plans to Swan Island employees. Already, we have seen ridership on the 85 Swan Island rebound from the double whammy of the worst recession since the, since the 1930s and the relocation of FedEx ground to Crowdsville. And we expect that as area employment grows and gas prices touch, or at this point surpass $4 a gallon, ridership again will approach 500 rides per day. Two major Swan Island employers, UPS and Bigger Industrial, now sell monthly transit passes at steeply reduced rates to their 2,000 plus employees. Moreover, the completion of the Wild Left Trail to the North Lama Boulevard will make the 85 Swan Island an attractive transit option for University of Portland staff, faculty, and students. The Swan Island Business Association and its Swan Island TMA project look forward to our continued partnership with TriMet as we grow up to 15,000 by the end of the decade. First class transit service is critical to our success. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mara Gross. Good evening, Dr. Bethel, Mr. McFarland. My name is Amara Crooks. I'm the Policy Director at Coalition for a Livable Future, um, which unites over 100 nonprofits, businesses, governments in the Portland metro area. Our work, including our work on transportation, focuses on promoting healthy communities where all residents have access to meet their daily needs um, and advance their well-being. And as you well know, transit is essential for the health and well-being of this region. And I'm sure, like many here tonight, Coalition for Livable Future is very concerned with the service cuts and fare increases that are still being proposed in its budget cycle. Frequent and reliable bus service is essential to robust transit systems, and cutting service and raising fares hurts our communities, particularly hurts the health and economic opportunities for low-income people who rely on the bus for work and school, and for whom a nearly 20% increase in fares is a serious burden. As regional climate scenarios are showing, we also need to increase transit service and release, excuse me, reduce reliance on driving to meet the challenge of climate change. As TriMet works through this challenging budget cycle, we ask that you keep these realities in mind at the forefront and prioritize bus service and decisions we make. Also, want to, I would like to thank TriMet for hearing community concerns and removing the proposal to eliminate ramp trip transfers. We don't have the adequate data to know who that change would impact, but we have good reason to believe that the people who use round trips the most, and um, who rely um, on transit the most, and are least able to pay, pay the increased fare, which would more than double what they're paying now, would be most impacted. Um, we have the time to keep that proposal off the table in future refinements, and that you work to improve data collection and analysis to better understand the environmental justice impacts of proposals like this. So thank you again for that. 
looking ahead, we need to inform the stabilized funding for transit operations. Um, that will take discussion of a range of strategies, including a com combination of operating efficiencies, revenue increases, and other, and other approaches. We also need to have a serious regional discussion of the trade-offs inherent with major capital projects. As we have learned all too well with Portland and Milwaukee, capital projects will increasingly need to be paid for with scarce local dollars, which has a serious impact on bus service, as well as on the budgets of other local governments. And Coalition for the Future look forward to being a partner in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear from S.W. Concert, and after Mr. Concert, I'd like to hear from Ms. Susan Green. Hello, it's Mr. Barlow. My name is S.W. Concert. I'd like to say first that the recent concessions that TriMet has made in the 2012 budget proposal are a small step in the right direction, and I applaud all of you for uh, your reconsideration. Um, that said, the dramatic change is still being proposed to eliminate zones and, as I understand, still most ra ra return trip transfers could have disastrous consequences both to transit ridership in the Portland metro area and to the goodwill that TriMet has enjoyed in the community. Uh, rather than shell out $5 for every round trip, uh, riders who currently use the bus or max for neighborhood errands would be tempted to crowd the streets with their cars and vans. This is especially true for families and people with limited mobility. Instead of charging the same rate for the downtown grocery shopper and the suburb the suburb commuter, which is what this new policy would do, the sensible choice for a bio transit system would be to retain the zone system and make it more equitable. Charging one dollar within a single zone, two dollars between two zones, and three dollars between for all three zones would be a simple and popular policy that would increase ridership and decrease the need for fair enforcement. The argument recently raised by TriMet that the continued expansion of transit outside the downtown core renders the zone system obsolete is, I'm sorry to say, a red herring. A max trip from Mississippi Avenue to the airport, or from Clackamas to Lloyd, or from Hillsboro to the zoo station. These are all three zone trips. As for TriMet's no round trip transfer policy, a, simple, uh, a similar policy was enacted several years ago by the Chicago Transit Authority. It proved so unpopular and needlessly complex that it was eventually scrapped. I urge you to keep the current transfer policy, but extend the life of a transfer to three hours to benefit the low-income <laughs> to benefit the low-income riders for whom for whom TriMet is the only travel option. I thank you for your time and for your openness to the concerns of your riders. Thank you. Susan Green, and after Ms. Green, I'd like to hear from Ms. Palmyra Cruz. Um, I just wanted to speak in favor of the free rail zone. That, that um, it just makes I was I didn't always speak today, so, so I'm trying to. It just makes living with Portland. Um, it, it, there's something very gracious about it, and it just makes you feel like you're in a city where I don't know welcomes you to go downtown, and I think that that people use the downtown much more because of this free zone. And um, I don't know, I don't have anything profound to say except that it enhances my life and makes it just a lot nicer and I think for a lot of people. Thank you. Ms. Palmyra Cruz. After Ms. Cruz, we'd like to hear from Mr. Victor Salinas. Buenas tardes, representantes de Dime. Good afternoon, Academy uh, Representatives. Mi nombre es Palmira Cruz. My name is Palmira Cruz. Y estoy aquí representando a mi familia y a mi comunidad latina. I'm here representing my family and the Latino community. Para mí es muy importante estar aquí. Para mí es muy importante estar aquí hoy. Y que me escuchen, ya que yo uso todos los días el transporte público. Y para que me escuchen, ya que yo uso todos los días el transporte público. Trabajo en las oficinas de la red latina. Trabajo en las oficinas de la red latina. Trabajo en las oficinas de la red latina. También trabajo en las escuelas Greenberg, Harvey Park, Rigler y César Chávez. También trabajo en las escuelas Greenberg, Harvey Park, Rigler y César Chávez. 
the uh, following schools, uh, Ranger, Manfair, um, Harvey Scott, and Sister Chuck's. Asisto entrenamientos. I attend uh, trainings. Reuniones. Meetings. Llevo mis hijas a visitas médicas. I take my children to medical appointments. Y para todo, para todo eso uso el transporte público. And I use public transportation for all those things. Y por esa razón me atrevo a pedirles lo siguiente. And it's for, it is for that reason that I dare to ask you the following. Uno, que no suban los precios y que si los suben sean accesibles para nuestras familias. One, not to raise fares and if you do raise them to make them accessible for families. Dos, ahora los niños de siete años para arriba ya tienen que pagar. As children or eight, you know, seven years older have to pay. Queremos que esa edad cambie a doce años. We want that uh, uh, change in the, in the requirement payment for children to be raised to 12 years old. Ya que 23.5 de nuestra comunidad son niños de entre 5 a 17 años. Because 23.5% of our, I think it's the right percent, uh, of our children are ages from uh, 7, 7, 5, 5 to 17 years old. Esto según el reporte de coalición de comunidades de color. This is according to the Queen's Color Report. Entonces, como ustedes pueden ver, tenemos familias grandes. As you can see, we have uh, large families. Y realmente necesitamos cambios. And we need changes. Ya que co como, como está la economía en estos momentos. Because as, as the, economy, the economy is currently. Para el simple hecho de llevar a nuestros hijos al doctor se los hace caro. Just simply to take our, our children to the doctor is turns out to be very expensive. Y será peor si los precios suben. And it will be worse if the prices uh, increase. Muchas gracias a los representantes de Trimet por darme la oportunidad de dar un testimonio. Thank you, Trimet representatives, for giving the opportunity to join this testimony. Now I'd like to hear from Victor Salinas, and after Mr. Salinas, we'd like to hear from Ms. Gretchen and Ms. Baron Bakke. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Victor Salinas, and I come here as a member of the Latino community and also in my role as a medical interpreter. Um, as a medical interpreter, I've seen many families struggling to get their children to their appointments. Oftentimes, there are services that provide transportation to the mother and to the child that is being taken to the appointments, but um, families are not able to make it because they don't have child care for the rest of their children today sometimes for go appointments. Uh, another situation is where families you know, have to take that uh, public transportation. They have to struggle to be able to pay the transportation for not only for their particular fact, especially if it's long uh, appointments that they have to have with their kids. Um, so for that, I would strongly urge them to consider bringing a family pass it's not for all families, at least for um, low-income families, um, which is great and needed for, especially within the certain communities, and I'm assuming in all um, communities, especially with the uh, people who have lower income, such as ourselves. Um, the other thing that I urge is to figure out a way that they can either subsidize or help uh, bring a type of uh, fair for, for people who are income because many times it's these communities that struggle to find employment. If you don't have transportation to get to your job or to get to a job interview, then how are you going to be able to pay for the bus fare? So any kind of fare that is going to be equitable for, for people who are income because we otherwise we don't have a way to get to work. Um, also many of the families are facing with a struggle that um, they are not able, or we're not being able to obtain a driver's license no longer in the state of Oregon. So we have to rely on public transportation uh, to get to the grocery store, to get to doctor's appointments, to get to work, and to visit our friends and family. So that's why I urge that we uh, consider a fair that would be the more early. For lower, uh, for the you know, person's gains, but that's what I'm going to say. But mainly, what I'd like to um, urge for you to consider is a family pass. Um, this would be very helpful for our community. Thank you. Thank you. 
Three, four, maybe three, three, four, five, six, six times a week. You know, that's um, thirty dollars a week times fifty-two dollars. That's you're getting up on close to two thousand dollars a year. And you're talking about families who are low income, who are making minimum wage. What kind of system are we putting into place in this city where we solve a budget problem on the backs of the poorest, most vulnerable people, the people who are plus dependent, the people who live in uh, low income communities and who are people of color in our community. That is simply not acceptable. It's not fair. I also want to finish up by saying that as you raise um, uh, fares and as you increase services, you've made it more and more difficult for people to do round trips for their everyday needs on a single ticket, and that has created a huge hardship. Every time you talk about this, I hear you talking about the fact that you don't like want people using transfers for round trips, but if that's what people need to do if they're going to be able to survive and use this bus service at all. And now that you've made the, the buses cut with the cuts, the trips are longer, so I want to urge you to consider putting back on the table, extending the transfers to three hours, so that people can be able to make their, meet their daily news, their needs for short trips to the store, to the laundromat, or what they need for their kids to be able to do that as a single ticket and restore value, especially for the, the poorest, most vulnerable uh, people in our community. Thank you. Jim Howe. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to talk to you today. Uh, I'd like to talk about three things. Uh, fares, uh, a Columbia River crossing, and my bus route. And three minutes. I have some suggestions up there. I want to thank you, first of all, for restoring the round trip on this. I just take it that, um, that is a very good thing. What I would like to see is some discounts for off-peak uh, ridership. And uh, this could be done fairly simply. And in fact, I think there also be discounts for multiple tickets. Uh, currently, you have ticket books, 10, 10 rides for 10, for <coughs> 10 fares. Uh, add another ticket to that book, make it 11 rides with the same amount of money. You probably wouldn't lose any money because you'd have more people using the system. And as far as, uh, you, you also can give about a 10% discount for off-peak use. Now, uh, we all know, uh, I used to be a planner to try that, so I know that peak hour service is the most expensive for you to provide. You have to have more buses out there, and, uh, and, they, and they get full. In the off-peak, you have excess capacity, and you get more people on the buses in the off-peak you end up generating more revenue. So it both benefits China and it obviously benefits those that can can take the bus and the off peak and get a discount. So the two fifty then drops down to a little over two dollars for those that want to take advantage of that. Uh, my bus route. My bus route is a three mile bus. When I moved into my house that <coughs> Soon after I did, when I was working in TriMet, it carried about 2,000 people a day. It currently carries 500. And that's not because of any change in demographics. It has to do with the service kept getting cut and cut and cut and cut. Now, I have a, a simple suggestion for this bus route. You add six more hours of service. You could extend it to Northwest Portland across the Fremont Bridge, a connection you never had before and you would have, and I guarantee you would more than double your ridership within a year if you did that. The third thing I want to talk about is CRC. That project is not going to get done, but I think that TriMet would be wise to consider an, what they call an MOS, a minimal operable segment that would take you to Hayden Island. And that then could be done in a reasonable length of time and actually give folks in Haven Island, which is part of Portland service. So those are my three points. I could go on for a little bit, but I'm going to quit right there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Pamela A. And it's like K without the calories, just A. <laughs> and I am president of the Northwest 
Burlington Industrial Neighborhood Association. And I am, <coughs> which has, it's from the Fremont Bridge to the St. John's Bridge, from the river to the mountain for St. Helens Road. And I'm also president of a small staffing firm that we place called Accounting Connections, and I place accounting and finance people, and a lot of them in that Northwest industrial area. I have this unique opportunity to talk with both companies and people that are looking for jobs. Companies that are looking for people and people that are looking for jobs. And part of the, the, the ideas that I would like to bring forth is I'm hearing more and more about the companies within the Northwest industrial area cannot consider people that are dependent on TriMet because they can't get there or their walking time or is so long. The example I'd like to give is just in the last couple of weeks there's a company, a long-standing company on St. Helens Road on like 30th in St. Helens. And a candidate called me and said, hey, I'm qualified for this job. And I said, yes, I know you are, but you're on the bus. It is Per, per route would be 39 minutes of walking time, and she's coming from Northeast Portland. Maybe we need Jim's bus to go into Northwest. <laughs> and, but also, it drops her off 0.8 miles from the job on St. Helens Road, which doesn't have sidewalks. Um, you know, our weather is wonderful. So it's it's something that she would not be able to do, or I should say the company has, has asked me not to, has asked me to have people that have their own transportation so that they can get there because the bus is so far away. Um, reducing the service out in Northwest Portland is just going to make it tougher for people like me to place people that have not had jobs and I really try to get companies um, to consider the folks that are bus dependent. And in that area, it's very difficult because the service is so scarce. So please reconsider um, having more buses out there as, as our jobs are growing fast. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear from Mr. Glenn Kirkendall, and after Mr. Kirkendall, I'd like to hear from Mr. Terrence Coleman. Hello, Mr. Dean. My name is Glenn Kirkendall. I work as a social studies and was a ranking farm member in my group, the Motion to Represent the Fire Fire Fire. I think uh, here is a different bus loss of independence each other, quite independent of each other. What is missing is increasing the funding for public transportation, which is the basic rights. And one thing we can do is try to set the power and clout to the Washington City Council to tax the big businesses here from their accounts and also tax like an income tax on the super rich here in Portland to help provide the needs for public transportation for all people, that's going fair and increasing transportation needs. Thank you. Thank you. I'm like John Coleman, I'm a member of Opal, environmental structures of Oregon, and also he's paused the action plan. I'm um, here today, I'm a transplant from New York. I've been here approximately four years. I was born in the Bronx, which they have a great mass transit system there. I moved to a little town called New York, New York which was only had a bus system. And, it, and for 30 years I stayed there. I'm here now and um I can't understand it. The um the rail system may be the arterials, but the um, buses are the arterial of the copper is the vein of the transit system. And if that's there, you can believe that this town is going to go down. You need the buses. The buses go everywhere. It's the max is limited. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm a member of Local Equality Justice of Oregon. Um, I live in the Rockwood neighborhood. 
the max is great and everything, but you know, to get across town, um, I've been at the customer service call center position. All the jobs are going to be able to do it It's an hour and a half ride for me. So, um, that makes it a little difficult. You know, I'm trying, you know, just for that uh, customer service, you know, call centers is, you know, but I mean, other stuff too, not just that. Um, but I write up 72, the 71, the 79, the 20, the 12, the 4, the 77. So I do write a lot of the buses, even though I'm on the, the light rail. And I'm um, always wondering, I'm posing possibly the idea. You guys are involved in the Portland streetcars. So if you guys spend so much money, what is the possibility of some of the businesses in the area, wouldn't it be beneficial for them to step up to the plate and possibly, you know, do their share? It might be able to free up some retirement funds, you know, a chunk of it. You know, is, is, have you pursued that? Is there, you know, um, among other possibilities that we've heard today, you know, maybe that would help. Um, another thing, you know, uh, if, if we do a, a single fare uh, all day, no, no uh, transfers. In my personal uh, position, I try to do the monthly bus passes, which is beneficial, and I get more bang for my buck that way. However, if you go away from that, it's going to hurt me, which in turn will hurt you, because when I don't have that money to go up to that that day, I'm going to be tra you know uh, commuting less. And I do depend on trying it for 100% of my. <laughs> Granted, I can walk here or there within within reason, which I do. Uh, you know, I'm not going to spend the bus money to go, you know, 10 or 20 blocks when I can walk that mile, half a mile. But when I don't have that five bucks to spend, you know, I'm not going to end up. It's just not going to happen. So anyway. I implore you to uh, seriously uh, in take all of our suggestions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Barrett. I've testified several times. I've now received my pink blood from unemployment. So now I don't have zero income in two weeks. I'm apparently chronically unemployed, um, and I'm really concerned when I heard the other mistakes say that businesses are asking don't hire people on the train <coughs> because they can't get there, which brings to mind what are the future cuts, um, other jobs in the area, for example, when I do finally get a job, and I am entirely transit dependent. I'm afraid that bus might get cut. I don't want that kind of worry. Um, we need to be able to get around town. I'd love to be able to, you know, go explore a bunch of places and, and such on a pass, on a daily pass, you know. Um, but I'm just real concerned for the overall health and well-being of our communities because I'm, I'm not alone. I am now going to be the uncounted. I'm not employed and I'm not receiving unemployment, so I now will not, not be counted, except by China as a, as a happy rider. Because I do love China, I truly do. And we just want to help you come to other, you know, look at and maybe come to other solutions so that people like me don't have to worry so much over daily trips and such. And that's all. Thank you so much. Kathleen Brown, and hello to the Trinet board and everybody else here. I have been driving Trinet lift buses for 14, almost 15 years. My husband over here said 26 years. Uh, we've been contracted out all this time. And the last time Trinet took the lowest bidder on it, which has given us quite a struggle for our contract. Um, when you contract it out, the contractor's only interest is to make a profit. We drive all ends of town. We don't pick up very many people. I mean, I'm telling you, I can give you an example. I drove a lady from North Portland 
off of Hudson and Ida, and then I took her over to Carruthers to pick up another lady to take one lady to 106, and then the other one back to Christian. Okay? I, I went clear out of my way. I could have picked up other people on the way. Well, yeah, they, they bill you for fuel. They bill, they bill you for the fuel, and they bill you for the, the mileage, and they bill you also for, for customers. I didn't get very many customers. I mean, there's a problem here. I mean, if they're going to be making a profit on our service, instead of, you know, keeping the money in our state, I mean, you're contracting it to, to Aberdeen Scotland. I mean, first transit, first student is not from this country. You guys need to, need, you told them not to outsource in your paperwork, the, your contracts that you signed with them, you have outsourced. When MB Transportation was here, we didn't have a problem with their contract. We need you to come and take us in-house or bring the MC back. We really have problems. The drivers are not happy. The drivers are not happy on the property. I've gone three years without a raise. You know, we've all gone three years without a raise. They have given us substandard insurance that we have to be reimbursed for. And I'm talking large amounts of money. If it was in-house, it would be a lot cheaper. Because I know you guys give them money to insure our drivers. Our part-time drivers don't have insurance. So there's a problem here. There's money getting pocketed. It's getting shipped out of the country. And everybody's getting a carriage raise as a result. We need to bring the lift service in-house. Mr. John Oster. And after Mr. Oster, I'd like to hear from... Mr. Sujata Patel. Thank you. Board um, member Saragosa, Pastor Bethel, General Manager of Barnes Banks. For the opportunity to testify, my name is John Oster, I'm the director of Social Environmental Justice Oregon. Um, I've got some of your data here that I want to talk about um, today because we've been asking the same questions for about two months now publicly around the budget. We've been working on the budget issue for about three months. The first month we were talking to ourselves because there wasn't a public process to engage with. The budget task force was not subject to open meeting laws, unfortunately. So when we have had the opportunity to engage, we started asking some fundamental questions about the budget. We may not agree on priorities. Opal prioritizes keeping fares affordable, making service frequent and accessible, and adhering to transit equity principles. You, we may not agree on the ultimate priorities, but we have to abide by the best information possible. We have to be transparent with that information. And so, unfortunately, for the last several months, we've been talking about this budget crisis, but your own data shows that there is no budget crisis. We're talking about a $12 million budget shortfall according to your, your public projections. Only 40% of that is the union health care costs. That's $5 million. You've deferred $5 million to the next fiscal year because of the timeline of the arbitration. So out of the $12 million that your latest projection shows, $5 million of that, 40%, is attributed to increased health care costs for the union. That leaves 60% to other sources. Well, $3 million of that is payroll tax revenue, and you're anticipating a declining growth of payroll tax revenue. That projection was done back in October when fiscal news was not as great. It was a reaction to some news in Europe that didn't manifest. And we've been asking for the last, you know, we've been asking for the last two months to see some update, updated numbers around the analysis. It's the end of March. We're wrapping up our, our public participation component of this budget cycle, and we still haven't seen some updated numbers on that payroll tax revenue. The fact is, is that the last two fiscal years, including fiscal year 12 that were three quarters of the way through almost, TriMets used a 4% growth rate for payroll tax revenue, and it's generated $7 million extra per year in receipts. So we've underestimated the amount of payroll tax revenue using a 4% growth rate. This current budget projection is based on a 3.5% growth rate, so a more conservative growth rate. That you're estimating a $3 million reduction when the two-year trend shows that we've gotten a surplus of payroll tax revenue using a 4% growth rate. And most economists will tell you 
it's probably somewhere in the 5% range. We don't, we're not here to tell you what the growth rate should be, but we know that the one that you're basing the budget projection on is too low. And your own document from the fall of 2010. Thank you, Mr. Oster. That's three minutes. Sorry, I still have about 30 seconds left. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm going to finish this. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Oster, that's three minutes. Can we do that here, everybody, in the room, please? That's three minutes. Well, Somebody else you can hear it. Can you give me your time? Thanks. So your own budget document from the fall of 2010 shows I'm that sorry, an 8% growth rate. Excuse me. No, no. Excuse me. no, no. Uh, is the person who gave me your time somebody who signed up to testify today? We'll yes, last week, and you, you didn't have me on the list. So we'll get everybody. Sure we'll get everybody signed up, and everybody will get the time. I'm, I'm going to be very honest, right? Yeah. Thanks. I understand. Your own budget documents from the fall of 2010 show that you were, you were expecting an 8% growth rate. So where 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 did these numbers go? You've got you've got this drastic reduction that now shows a loss that frankly is in is, is the worst from reality. And we'd like to see some updated numbers on these budgets so that the public can engage meaningfully in this in this decision making process. Because right now we're restricted based upon the limited numbers that you're providing. So it's time, it's long overdue, we've asked them for two months to see some updated projections. This is six months. Thank you, Mr. Oster. That's thirty seconds. Uh, hi, my name is Sujan Patel, and I just want to address a few concerns I have about coming through Grail Zone. Um, when I first came to Portland, um, I thought the Grail Square was a really brand new, it was really easy to take. You know, the bus is everywhere downtown um, within, the, within the general area. Um, but I think it was bad enough for the the square and the rail zone because I think it made it a lot more inconvenient for people to travel within um, um, the boundary if they weren't you know, directly on a rail zone. So I think there are a few reasons why I think the free rail zone is bad. First of all, I looked at the facts um, of cost of ridership um, per type of mode of transit on the private website, and it shows that the cost of running the max is less than $2 per person, whereas um, the buses are even higher than that. The West cost between $10 and $23, and the Lyft service costs um, of $30 on average per rider. And I think it's unfair to punish the max riders when it costs such a low amount to make up for the other services that cost more. I don't know if there are ways to figure out um, ways to cut the cost of the other services, but per ride, per rider, the max doesn't cost um, very much, and in fact, it's the lowest cost service in kind of survived. Um, second of all, I think the free rail zone helps increase paid ridership elsewhere. I know a lot of people may not take public transit because it's confusing, they think it's really hard to get around, but if people are able to take the max downtown, take the street car, and be like, oh, hey, it's not that hard to get down. Um, I know definitely some of my friends, it has led them to buy a single ticket, to buy monthly passes so that they realize, oh, because it's so easy and convenient, I'm going to take the bus, which is a paid fare, elsewhere um, to other parts of the city. Um, Next, uh, I also saw that 84% of TriMet riders own their own cars, so they would prefer to take TriMet. I think that cutting the free rail zone, you'll see a lot of people who uh, decide to drive their cars instead of leaving even at home. Um, and lastly, I think uh, the free rail zone is one of the things that make Portland uh, a unique city. I know it's a draw definitely for not only people coming from out of town, but people who want to go downtown for a quick errand. Um, but uh, instead of paying you know, $5 round trip, which is what it seems like it's going to cost, um, it's a lot more people are you know, using that service to go downtown to support businesses uh, downtown. But if that's going to be cut, I think they're going to see a drastic decrease in ridership. And that's going to translate to lower uh, ridership for the paid fares um, elsewhere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to hear now from Mr. Joe Throw. Uh, first, I'd like to ask is 
Can you respond to questions that I asked? Unfortunately, not today. Hmm. However, there are Trinet representatives here in the room who can respond to your question. You know, the fact that we're forced to just ask questions and then you don't give us the answers is a typical way that power structures <laughs> try to I'm sick of going to government dialogues. You know, Obama tells us to get involved, and then the people in power just take notes, and then they actually never answer questions in public. So I think, first thing I want to say is the importance that all people, it's muy importante que todos la gente está aquí y dice a los amigos a llegar a la próxima reunión. Gracias. Okay, the second thing I want to say is, so I said it's important that everyone tell all their friends to come. until. You got to start answering questions in front of us. No more of this. We talk, and you just go away in your cars. My second question is: How many, how many of the four of you, at any time in March, have been behind the wheel of a car? Please raise your hand. Okay. Only one of you has been behind the wheel of a car. Okay. Great. So my next question is: Does the board, if you really care about people, and I assume in your intent, your heart, you do? Do you have the power to appoint a bus dependent board member nominated by the people? Because you're the board, you can change the rules, right? Okay? I think it's worthy that you guys on the board, if you really want to do what you're saying here, you go on to little meetings where we're not there, and you say, you know what, Joe's right, we should have one board member who never gets behind the wheel of a car. you to answer all the questions that are on the tape. And thank you to the stenographer and the translators. And I want to see them in writing on your website. You've got the staff to do it. All those great ideas. The family pass. Oh my god, I never even thought of that. I love my public. Okay? <laughs> and finally, stop scapegoating the unions in your media outreach. Yeah. You don't, you don't do the scapegoating here because you know we stand up to you, and then you have to answer questions. And finally, oh. um, your solutions are always based on assumptions that you've contacted all writers. Please stop making assumptions and make an ass out of you and me. And please start random, unbiased contact with non-writers and poor people. And I thank everyone for coming out today. Right on! Um, I'm just here because uh, I feel that TriMet is a basic piece of infrastructure to the not only to the Portland City of Portland, but also to the uh, entire metro area. Uh, I'm very concerned, particularly that the careless square surface is being cut. I'm quite honestly a casual user of TriMet on the bike commuter, um, but I think that TriMet is there and I support TriMet 100% uh, because I believe it adds to the uh, livability of our city and of our region. And I think cutting Fairless Square really detracts from the center of Portland as a, uh, as a cultural venue, as a place where visitors come and get some ideas that they can take back to their communities about how to run a transit service, how to run a city of uh, our size. Um, I think that's, that's all I have to say. I would like to reconsider uh, the cost of Fairless Square, and I'd like them to look at a broader base of beneficiaries. I'm an indirect beneficiary of TriMet service. I don't use the bus on a daily basis or the, or the rail. Uh, nonetheless, my parking rates downtown are lower because there's not as much competition for that. Uh, there are all sorts of indirect benefits that I think the board should consider, and the board should really broaden its definition of beneficiaries when it's looking to spread the cost out of uh, TriMet service. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear now from Mr. Kevin Provence, and after Mr. Provence, we'd like to hear from Ms. Crystal Elinsky. Yes, good evening, Kevin Provence. I'm in the Northwest District. A um, few of us are trying to get the meetings, so I'm representing the Northwest District. Those folks who take the 17, the 77, the 16, well, soon to be the 16, and the 15. And the concern that the Northwest neighbors are, who constantly ride or, or commute on the bus, are concerned about the new configuration of the lines. 17 is going away, 77 will replace the uh, uh, 17. The problem is, currently, we uh, access uh, the, tri the transit walls 
the new configuration will not allow us to access the transit mall and will be the only district um, of all five districts in the city that will have no access to the transit mall. The transit mall is a huge area for those who commute outside the city to catch their bus. So the time limits are already short. If we have no access down the, uh, the transit mall, then we're not going to be able to get to our buses in time to be able to collect a Suigo, get the wallets into the other places that we work. So we're quite concerned that there is no access going down the transit mall with this new proposal. And we'd like to see a, a proposal that will show the 77 at least having access up and down the transit mall prior to uh, having access over the uh, steel bridge. Thank you. Hello, my name is Colby Lemke. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, as I was able to speak last week, so I guess I'm here really to hand over some time, but as long as I've got the mic charged in, I'd like to give you an update on what I was saying last week. And um, and my first impression of meeting some of you, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of upset right now because I feel like I was misled by you. I actually asked you directly if you took the bus, if all of you took the bus, everybody in the NAM committee took the bus to work and you said yes, and now I find that when you drive behind the wheel of a car on a regular basis, and then I'm thinking about the story I didn't manage to tell you on the microphone, which was my friend who almost had a job in the night hours but couldn't get it. It was at Macy's, the Clackamas Town Center, because they wanted to do a two-hour window. Um, leaving work at possibly midnight, which there's no public transit. Okay, you don't get it. And I don't imagine that you have that problem with your job. So I, that's an update on that. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be a person that you have to like I did. I'm so upset. Um, I just feel like this is really surreal because my point last week was that we had a good system back in the 90s, and why are we even here talking about cuts when we should be demanding more service than we ever had because more people need it than ever. Our society needs it, Mother Earth needs it. It's ridiculous. And uh, so I still time to head over to that thing. So what else? Um, oh yeah, I have an idea too. I did a little research. But I remember in Poland they had these tickets and other places in the States where you can count the time you pay for amount. And, and then that way you just to stick your card in the little machine and it comes up and you can see the little dot on how close you are to your, your full uh, like that. Yeah. Why not get that? And then the poor drivers don't have to sit with, you know, tough situations. Oh, and that reminds me. I was waiting for the other lady who was here that I actually spoke to afterwards. And I told her a lot of my complaints, and she was nodding and agreeing like some of you are today. But the one thing she contested me on is this, is that the bus drivers don't get breaks like they used to. That's right. Uh, thank you. And I soon spend in my own call with about 20 drivers, and they're like, all right. We don't get our breaks. Like she contested that. She said, no, they get a break. But I think, again, it's something we could research if we have the data, which Mr. Cat's person, that nice young gentleman, is going to talk a little bit more about. Because if we had the data at the time when they arrived to their destination, like on my line six, don't cut it. That was your thank you. That was your cue. I, I yield my time. <laughs> At this time, I see that no one else has signed in to provide testimony tonight. Is there anyone here who did sign in, wanted to provide testimony, but was not called on? What is your name, sir? Greg Baker. Basically, I could go any place and basically, I would have to pass on the car. 
the system I think works great uh, in a lot of ways, uh, but uh, you're you're, you're uh, projecting to eliminate the free rail zone, and I, I live in the lakes Texas, and and since since I retired, uh, I I use the uh, I use the the, the uh, max to go downtown uh, frequently, and to to shop, to go to uh, to uh, entertainment, cultural events, and. Uh, Meetings and worships and all kinds of things. And uh, just, uh, I, boy, eliminating that, that zone is, is just, just breaks me apart. I mean, uh, I think that uh, it's really nice to have uh, the, the people that use the events in the, in the Rose Garden area and at the at the convention center, uh, I, I think it's really nice to, for them to be able to stay downtown and come there to those events. It's nice for the people in the Lloyd Center District to use it to go downtown. Uh, you know, and then it's, and for retired people, it's more than nice. It, it, it saves you a ton of money, you know, and, and uh, you're on a fixed income. And I, and I, I noticed that there's a lot of, of uh, I've heard testimony from low-income families, and, and you know, it, you know, for, and I've seen them. I've seen them. I see them on the on the uh, max line, and boy, if, if they're paying two bucks a pop for a family of five every time they run from the Lewiston area to downtown, you know, they can't afford it. Uh, so I think it enhances shopping opportunities. It, it enhances opportunities for low-income families, it enhances opportunities for retired people, uh, and it, it, it's a great thing to, to have for the city. To, uh, it, it's, we, you know, we have a television series about us, and you know, they, it's, it's a great thing to advertise Portland. Gee, we have a fairly zone downtown. You don't even have to, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. You just jump on it and go. And, Wow, that's that's great to be able to say that, and uh, I just feel it, it's a real loss to the the, the metropolitan area and down in the Portland area if you if you do away with the uh, spirit rules on the campus system. Thank you. Thank you. the meetings that you have to hear from people. It's really important if we want to talk about democracy that you hear from a wide swatch of people. And I, I also um, I want to I want to advocate for time and I really thought a lot about um, if you tell me how you want me to advocate, I will. Um, because I believe in this system and I get that there's more going on than just your will. Um, however, I do think the lack of creativity in what you're thinking about in terms of cuts and whatnot is not setting it up for the long term. Because I do ride the bus, my mother rides the bus, and I do drive the car. And I can't use the bus as much as I would like because I can't afford to keep getting on it and paying for my car insurance. And, you know, I feel like if you keep raising the fare, you make it less accessible for people who would be willing to support you. I want to ride the bus. I do sometimes ride the max. It's, you know, it's slick. However, the max is not going to get, um, it doesn't get you where you need to go. It doesn't get everybody where they need to go. Uh, also, I would like stronger um, research on uh, what is the impact on, these, on communities as we think about these cuts, as we think about how people are using the bus, what is the impact of what we're proposing? And I um, strongly believe in premium fares for premium service. And when I ride the number six bus, and it's so packed that there's not a seat, that people can't, the bus driver is constantly saying, I can't see you, I can't see you, when they open the doors, um, that is a serious issue, that is a safety issue. And also, it, it doesn't make me want to ride the bus because it's not, I mean, it doesn't feel good. Um, I, I am 
concern about the Portland street car subsidies. I'm concerned that, for, that TriMet is paying for that. That's really problematic for me when you're talking about making cuts in farther areas. I mean, I want a system that can really care for all of us and that is not um, something where if you have a lot of money, you benefit. Um, uh, performance efficient metric, uh, efficiency measures, I am concerned about that. Um, and um, yeah, and really, I would like more transparency on your numbers. I do think there's more going on than what you're sharing, and we need to know more. So, thank you.
and thereby maybe saving maybe fifty thousand a month that I can use for food because right now I have to make choices of buying certain, you know, not buying certain foods to be able to, you know, pay for the national transportation. Entonces, yo, yo pienso que así como yo estoy en una situación muy apretada y pienso que si van a, a subir los costos me va a afectar mucho a mí y así como me va a afectar a mí va a afectar a mucha comunidad pobre. So I think that you know because we're already in a tight, you know, the situation tight squeeze you know, economically, you know, I'm going to be impacted, you know, very hard as are all the families in my situation. Yo pienso que a ustedes no les preocupa mucho el alza porque ustedes tienen buenos salarios, buenos carros, entonces a ustedes no les preocupa el alza de, de, del costo de los bases. So I think that, you know, perhaps you're not, you're not uh, worried about the, the cost in regards to the rise of prices because you earn the salaries, but uh, I don't. Pero una persona que gana el salario mínimo y va a pagar 400 dólares mensuales de puro bases, uno sí, sí piensa y se come mucho la, la, la suya de preocupación. But, you know, for a person like myself that earns minimum wage and pays $400 a month, you know, we, we do worry. Uh, and, and I, you know, have to sometimes eat the finger nails too. Yo solamente eso les venía de... So that's the thing that was going to share. Thank you for listening.
might you affect other youth in the community and start crime rates will go up in your, in your buses and that will lead you to hire more security and make you guys more other work you guys have to do. And I really don't, trying to, uh, you guys are great, like, uh, I love your services, but the situation, you have to look into the people's views, not only what is, what is, it seems like you guys wanted it into like a business, not, it does not affect the community, and this, it's not right, and you guys gotta look at how, if you were in this person's shoes, and if you're coming from an immigrant family, or coming from a low income family, how would this affect your lives? So I urge you guys to make sure that you guys respect and understand the other people's point of view that, that are affected in this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. To everyone. I'm also a part of the, the uh, group of uh, the leaders and representing here today my community. I want to ask you as a favor to consider the, the prices for the bus. I come from a large family. I have three ch uh, children. My husband is the only one that works. So I'm, you know, I'm the one that is traveling with on the bus with my my three children, and I think that will be the high, the cost them too high. So I hope that you consider, you know, the, the, those prices, you know, given the, that we are, you know, come from large families and there are many of us in our communities that are seeing So if I'm understanding you more, you know, people that, you know, they can make those decisions. So I imagine that none of you would like to take you know, any practice to resolve all the, all the challenges you face uh, in training. So I hope that you consider you know, that these are the Thank you for your time. this really unique phenomenon um, that is emerging from China's proposal, which is that transit-dependent people, people who don't have cars and depend on public transportation, are being disproportionately impacted by this proposal. Um, there's a lot of fancy statistics and things that we can go over um, to make this argument, but what happens fundamentally when you eliminate fare zones and the free rail zones is you eliminate any kind of distance-based payment um, for the system. Everybody will pay the same, no matter how far they travel. Which means somebody who gets on west in Wilsonville and rides that $28 subsidized ride from Wilsonville to Beaverton and then takes the max from Beaverton to Gresham to go to work or whatever, pays the same as a single mother who just needs to take the bus two miles to the grocery store. There's no difference, according to China, between the transit use of the person who travels 30 miles and the person who travels three miles. They pay exactly the same. Now, like the zone system, I'm not out here to advocate for it. I think it needs to change. But there's something fundamentally unfair about the way that we're structuring fares by eliminating any reference whatsoever to the distance that people travel. 
Now, of course, one solution to this would be extending the transfer times that people get to three hours so that they could make more use of the TV that they get. And it helped as a way of sort of quasi-indexing uh, people's tra uh, travel to, to distance. Um, but what's also really important is that two-zone tickets go up the most. They burden a two-zone ticket rider right now is almost a 20% increase in their travel. That's the majority of adult riders in, in Portland. Even two-zone pass riders, their prices go up 23% under the current proposal. Again, majority of pass riders. These are huge, huge increases for people who mostly already can't afford it. And people who are even on more marginal income and are using a single ticket to make a round trip, the overwhelming majority of those people are using two-zone tickets. When these people become riders formerly known as two-zone riders, their fares go up in huge amounts. They're disproportionate. Now, the second thing that I just want to say really quick is something about um, TriMet as, as an agency. I admire TriMet. I, think, I really do think that it's one of the better trans agencies in the country. And I know that in the 90s, um, TriMet became a model. We can maybe even go back to the 70s. TriMet became a model uh, for public transportation. Thank you. That's true. 10 seconds yes. and it's positive. <laughs> I'm trying to miss you. Trying to have an opportunity to be a leader again. We hear a lot about difficulties getting the research, or getting the data that, that Opal would like to help do these equity analysis. Um, and one of the responses that we get is that no other trans agency does this. You know, uh, this is complicated no, stuff. Trans we have the chance to be a leader on trans. We have the chance to to recapture the attention of, of the nation by leading the movement to be transparent with all the transit agencies that respond to the need of people who depend on transit the most. That's the future of transit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's sad to hear. 
that some of them have to even work to pen. Because they can't make it, they can't hold it. That, that is for you. You need to take care of your employees better. That's right. Yes. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. There is nobody else to come in tonight to sign to prepare to deliver testimony tonight. So I'd like to take a 15 minute break and reconvene in 15 minutes. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to come back to your seat.